Hey folks, before we get to this week's episode of Positively Trek, I'd like to take a moment to give a special thanks and shout out to some of our Patreon supporters. It is you who makes it possible for us to bring you this show each week. So, thank you so much to Carl Morris, Joyce Marin, Jim Stoffel, Dave Garcia, Rick Young, and Paul D. Kinnear. To become a Patreon supporter of Positively Trek, simply go to patreon.com slash positively trek. You can join at any level, which will give you early access to some episodes and access to other features including associate producer credits and shout outs thank you so much to those of you who have already pledged to help out the show and to everyone else thank you so much for listening and now let's get on with the show all right give me the bad news magnetized ionic plasma in those fragments overloaded the ship's systems it's like we were hit with an emp warp course offline what about reserves backup power cells are down Captain, it's all down. But we're still moving? Momentum plus the Laparian gravity well. What that means? Unless we figure something out, first contact is going to be us crashing into that planet. Okay, that's enough existential dread. Let's get back to work. Welcome, everyone, to Positively Trek. I'm Bruce Gibson with Dan Gunther, and we are going to do our last, last podcast of this season of Lower Decks about First First Contact. So, Dan, are you ready to talk about the season finale of season two of Lower Decks? I honestly didn't think I'd be ready because, like, I'm just going to lay it all on the table here. I love Lower Decks. It's such a fun exciting addition to the star trek universe and 10 episodes just goes by so quickly and i'm so sad to say goodbye to season two and i know there's lots more star trek on the way and all that sort of thing but man is this not just the best 10 weeks of of star trek it's just so much fun to talk about these shows and to enjoy this crew and and ah ah i'm just gonna be gushing now (laughs) i know because it really is a lot of fun to watch And especially when we're Star Trek fans and we know all the little nuances of Star Trek so we can appreciate all the little in-jokes and Easter eggs and things throughout like that. It's it's been a lot of fun. And you're right. It did just like fly by. I I just can't believe we've gone through 10 episodes. Not only that, but it feels odd to me that we've even gotten through two seasons. Mm -hmm. Like Lower Decks still feels like a new show to me, but it's it's already past its second season now. Absolutely. Yeah. And a third season on the way. So, you know, we're we're not done with Lower Decks by any stretch. It's just there's going to be a bit of a break now. So, yeah, but there's more to come. That's the that's the big takeaway. And this show, I think, is has been a huge success. I mean, I see the reactions online and generally speaking, they're very positive, especially the back half of season two here. I think it's just been kind of winner after winner after winner. And uh, is can the same be said for the season finale? I don't know. Let's see. Ooh. Oh, gosh. Now I'm worried because I don't know what you think. Actually, Hmm. I do think I know what you think. So. (laughs) I think I got a little indication when we messaged each other the other day. So, yeah, I think we're good to go. So I have to just, I don't know. I just want to jump in. I've got so many thoughts about so many different things. And we're going to go into spoilers. So we're going right into the episode. And the first thing I want to mention is the one thing that I shouted out loud, yay, like that, was the dolphins. Mm-hmm. The dolphins yep. in the on on the ship was just like <gasps> I got so excited about the dolphins because we've heard about for years that the Enterprise D apparently had these not not these same dolphins I'm assuming but dolphins on the ship. Yeah, so we get to finally see cetacean ops and the two. Now apparently they are actually beluga whales is what I've been reading. Oh. And we have two two of them, Kimolu and Matt are their names. And <laughs> they were, I mean, okay, again, cards still on the table. I, I did love this episode and there's so much great stuff in this episode. But the best thing in this episode were Kimolu and Matt because 
they're so much fun, <laughs> you know. Oh, Rutherford, you're looking sweaty. Do you want to get those broad shoulders in here and swim with us? And uh, <laughs> you know, when everything's all said and done at the end, you say, "Oh, you know what's a great stress reliever? Skinny dipping, guys." Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I love these two. <laughs> I almost now just want to picture Spock from star trek 4 jumping in there and mind melding with them mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? absolutely but not skinny dipping no i do not want to see naked spock that but would not be logical it would not <laughs> i know some people want to see a naked spock but i don't um but yeah i like that and i liked how boimler had to go down there to unlatch the mag cl- the mag clumps or whatever the clamps Mm-hmm. clumps <laughs> the clamps <laughs> that they're called clumps on a packlid ship but <laughs> that's right they're clumps on a packlid but clamps on the cerritos or federation ship and that they're not designed for flippers you know they yeah take, they take offense that they can't do anything about it so i just wonder what is their purpose on the ship i i'm assuming assisting with navigation i love i i did take a close look at cetacean ops because i was curious about it and i like that they have like control panels that are under the water kind of surrounding them so i don't know yeah the, what they're doing probably related to navigation i think that's what they said in the like original tng blueprints and technical manual that, that that's what cetacean ops was kind of around because they're natural good navigators but yeah i don't know we don't get a ton of explanation i kind of feel bad for them because they're isolated i mean do they like hover around in there they're swimming around and nobody comes to visit them and then somebody finally comes by and they're all excited because you know anytime there's like a crew party they can't make it they're just stuck down there all the time oh i never thought of that you know i I was thinking that you know that that work area they have is pretty small but i'm assuming there's like various tubes that connect to like their living areas and that sort of thing so i wonder if there's just this whole secondary crew of the of the ship that we're not seeing that they have their own parties and all that kind of thing but they do mention you know captain freeman day which is part of this episode and apparently their calves take part in that but but they don't because that's just for kids right (laughs) right i love that line it's just it's for calves why would they even (laughs) participate i like what you're saying though about that maybe there's other areas of the ship they can swim to because it made me think of star trek 09 where Scotty got beamed into that tube of oh, like, yeah. liquid engineering <laughs> and he's swimming around and going, it's like maybe they can like swim throughout the ship like that. That would be really cool. Hmm. That'd be interesting. Their own Jeffrey's tubes, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Water Jeffrey's tubes. Yeah. I mean, if you can have on the discovery, like a big open area with all of these turbo lifts flying around, you can certainly have little tubes of water. Oh Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I still see I still want to see a layout of Discovery that has that big open area. I want to see this, the blueprints of that. Mhm. I f- I feel like it's like at Starfleet there's somebody just like Worf in Trials and Tribulations that whenever they get asked they just say we do not discuss it with outsiders. <laughs> right. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time he said that, right? So um going to captain freeman day that was enjoyable too because of course the sign that boimler's point putting together looks like the captain picard day sign very similar to that and of course this is made for kids but boimler wants to do it and he wants to appreciate the captain and the captain appreciate that he appreciates her and all that and at the very end when he's like does she know i made the signs and you know well maybe and all that and he's just like captain <laughs> captain <laughs> Me, Boimler. Boimler made the sign. It was me. <laughs> but yeah, isn't that a isn't that a arts and crafts day for toddlers? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, I know people like that. You know, want to get kissing up to the boss, but they don't make little toddler signs. <laughs> I just imagine that in my office. Uh, well, I'd, I'd hate for Boimler to lose his childlike innocence because that was a lot of fun. That was fun, yeah. So now this episode started off there doing a rendezvous with the Archimedes, which is an Excelsior-class ship. Actually an Obana-class starship. Oh, see, okay, I was going to say, but is it still called an Excelsior at this point? (laughs) Because it looks very similar. So see, I knew you would know. 
Yeah, it's so Mike McMahon said it's it's sim it's like the replacement for the Excelsior. It's a lot bigger than the Excelsior for one thing, but it's a, it's a similar design. It's kind of fulfilling that role in the fleet, but it's like the newer version of it. And it's yeah, it's called an Obana class starship. Where did you see this? Was did he tweet that out? Uh, it's tweeted out. It's on Memory Alpha. Um, discussions about the episode and that sort of thing. Yeah. I'll oh, see. I haven't read anything online, <laughs> so. Darn it, Mike McMahon. You have to call me when there's stuff like this, so I know. Gosh. Okay. So I I thought the ships were beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. The the new design, first of all, for this starship, just gorgeous. And was the animation in this episode not just spectacular? The the movements of the ships and and I know like basically doing CGI work for ships in lower decks is basically the same as doing it for the live action shows. It's just different models, different lighting, different, that kind of thing when you're creating the, the scene in a computer. So it, it looks live action quality here. It's so gorgeous. I can't imagine what their budget for animation for this episode was because they it looks like they put a lot of money into the, making this look really good. Yeah, because there were times where I was watching the ships and I thought it looked like real, like I'm watching a movie, not even just an animated series like this. I was like, wow, that's starting to look even more real than what we typically see in an animated show like this. But it, it did feel very movie cinematic quality to it, especially when... The Archimedes then got hit by that wave. It reminded me of Star Trek VI. I expected Gomez to go, turn her into the wave. <laughs> <laughs> shields! Shields! <laughs> so how great was it to see Captain Sonia Gomez? That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. I've been kind of in the back of my mind waiting for it a little bit all season because, of course, that was leaked early on by the actor herself uh, still remains to be seen whether she was allowed to leak that at the time or not but you know i've kind of it's been in the back of my, my mind not something that i've been like bringing up or anything like that but i kept kind of every once in a while thinking wait are we supposed to see lycia naff as sonia gomez at some time at some point and finally here in the final episode of the season we get to see her that was fun the fact that she's not a working actor anymore and came out of retirement of that part of her career to do this, I think is pretty special. Like, uh, yeah, anytime we see a, a legacy character come back, I think that's great. And Sonia Gomez was a lot of fun back in the day. So it was really cool to see her again. And of course, in the back of our minds, being the, uh, the lit verse folks that we are, we know that she's in Starfleet Corps of Engineers I would have loved to have seen a little nod to that. There was, I thought, one in the episode, but I, I looked closely at it and it wasn't quite. In Sonia Gomez's ready room, there's a model of a ship behind her. And at first I thought it was a Sabre class ship, like the Da Vinci that she was on in uh, Corps of Engineers. But unfortunately, it's an Akira class ship, so it's, it doesn't quite fit that. I, I got really excited for a moment, though. Oh, no, that would have been cool. Yeah, because you're right. I mean, as someone who's big into the books, when she popped up on screen and they said Captain, I'm like, oh, yeah, the Starfleet Corps of Engineers. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. And I had forgotten about, you know, the actress leaking that out. I mean, I remember when the season started thinking about it maybe in the first episode and the second you know around that time oh at some point we should see gomez and then i've forgotten about it since so i haven't been looking for her so as soon as she pops up on screen i'm like oh yeah well i'm glad it happened at least by the the last episode right <laughs> yeah so that was pretty cool and i liked how uh she had that one officer that trips on her bridge and she's like, I've done way worse in front of a much more intimidating captain. <laughs> yeah. I love that little nod. I mean, probably her most memorable bit as Sonia Gomez in TNG. She was only in two episodes, but like, that's the scene we remember. And I love that they played homage to that. Yeah. It's so weird when you say she's only in two episodes because we read the novels and he, she's even been in comics. Like I think of her as a fairly prominent character 
that mm. we that we see, and then to think, oh, well, those who don't read novels and comics, yeah, she only made two appearances, and that's not much of anything. Well, now we can say three. She's made three on screen. Yeah. So that's good. But I do have to say at the beginning of this episode, and I'm curious to know what you think, Dan, because we've kind of talked earlier in the season about Admiral Freeman, Captain Freeman's husband. Will we ever see the two of them together? together and we did but it was like nothing like there was no acknowledgement of them being married or any kind of personal conversation i was like that's it i have to say i was a little disappointed that's funny my my reaction was different i actually really liked that scene because it was an official meeting and i loved that there was no acknowledgement of this because they're in a professional setting i thought like when the scene started, I was like, oh no, there's going to be some like silly joke or something like that here, but they're the consummate professional Starfleet folks and they're in the presence of another captain in an official meeting and they act their rank, you know? And I really, I actually really appreciated that. I I mean, it would have been nice maybe if there's another scene afterwards that was just the two of them together, but the fact that they were so professional in this setting, I actually really appreciated that. But see, that's what I was expecting, because when I saw them, and of course, yes, like you said, they're in a mean, they're professional. I thought, oh, now they're together. Okay, we're going to see a scene, like you're saying, like there'd be an additional scene of the two of them talking to a husband and wife, but also the parents of Mariner. And I thought there was going to be some conversation that, you know, what about if you decide to leave the ship? What about Mariner? Oh, you know how she can oh, be. And like, I was yeah. expecting some kind of family dynamic thing start to happen. I was like getting really excited. I'm like, oh, we're finally going to get that moment. And there was nothing. Now, we still have another season. So we could see that in the premiere episode, something like that. But yeah, that's kind of where I was ex- was uh, leaning towards and expecting. So I mean, that's a slight disappointment. It didn't ruin the episode for me, but I, I was waiting for it and nothing happened. But I got mm-hmm. dolphins or whales, whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they're going to go on this first contact mission with the Archimedes to the Lapirians in the lap system. And they have to go. Then the Cerritos has to install these subspace transponders. And then after that's done, they can join this first contact celebration with the Armedes and the Lapirians. Then we find out, or Mariner overhears, that her mother is being promoted and she's going to be possibly leaving the ship. And I enjoyed this because she's freaked out that her mother's leaving and she goes to the other lower deckers about it. And Boimler's like, boy, Ransom is going to be really upset. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. And she goes to the senior officers. I have a little secret of something that you need to know. And I just love how they're all pissed that she hasn't told them that she's going to leave the ship. What do you think about that storyline? It's that's a fun storyline. And I mean, it, it, the the psychological stuff behind it, the fact that Mariner is obviously really going to going to miss her mother on the ship, you know, but she's not willing to admit that, you know, until, of course, we get the, the scene at the end. But, you know, this is kind of continuing Mariner's immature streak, I guess, maybe this season where we're still seeing that side of her kind of coming out and and that kind of thing. And. I love that she gets kind of this little arc over the course of the season and over the course of this episode, which brings us to, you know, again, jumping all over the episode, but as far as the characters go and as far as like their personal journeys go, my favorite scene, which is Boimler and Mariner at the end in Cetacean Ops, where he finally just calls her on her BS and says, shut up, Mariner. You're going to miss your mom. You're worried that you're not going to have time to say goodbye to her and all this kind of stuff. Go do that. Like for crying out loud, Mariner. And she doesn't have like a witty comeback to it. She's like, ah, yeah, you're right. Okay. You know, I love that. I love that she's gotten to this place where, you know, she's acting out against her captain, against her mother, doing this stuff behind her back, telling her senior officers, being an agent of chaos, but it's all because of her, you know, needs as a daughter, you know, and I I just love, I love that. I thought that was a really great place for her character to end up. 
No, I totally agree. I mean, that was a very important scene for Mariner. I was still hoping that we'd find out a little bit more about her background, about why she is the way she is. But I loved it that she's being told by her friends that, you know, you're you're going to miss her. Just admit it, you know, and don't be so defensive. And even the conversations between Mariner and Captain Freeman before that were about, you know, Freeman's like, why are you always fighting everything? Why are you always going against it? You know, and let people into your life and be, you know, have friends, you know. And it's like, I, I'm sure as the series continues, we'll find out a little more and more why these things are set up this way for her. But I really appreciate them really focusing that that on her and her coming to the realization that, you know, it takes her friends to to kind of push her, you know, like nudge her to go, you know, it's okay, You know, it's okay that you're upset that your mother's leaving. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Don't fight against it. Don't get so defensive. Don't put the shields up. You know, we got we got shields. We got to worry about on other things. Just don't put it up on yourself, you know. And then she gets to the bridge and they both apologize to each other. And I love that too. So. Yeah, it was a great little scene. Very touching and just shows how far these characters have come over two seasons. I really, really like that. Yeah. And you know, somebody's in the wrong if Tendi starts yelling at you. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of Tendi, poor Tendi, you know, she's all upset because she thinks she's going to get kicked off the ship because Dr. Tiana's like, yo, she's not good enough, you know. Or not that she's not good enough, but, you know, she's not cut out for medical and deletes her file. And Tendi over here, gosh, this is almost like Three's Company. Everybody's overhearing things and misinterpreting. Hmm. But uh, you bring up a great point, and it is literally my only complaint about this episode. And it's very minor. And I've always really been annoyed by that sitcom trope of, you know, something's happening and somebody overhears something and they misinterpret it and they (laughs) assume something different. And that always just kind of is a little bit like, uh, to me. But at the same time, Lower Decks is a sitcom. It's a half hour situational comedy. And they're going to use those tropes from time to time. And I totally understand The thing that redeems this for me is the lovely story that we get because of it, which is Tendi reminiscing about her time on the Cerritos and remembering her great times with Rutherford and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, some good things come of this, but there's that just little bit of annoyance that, you know, oh, there's the the misunderstanding and that sort of thing, which is, you know, better done here than it is done in some comedies as well, where, you know, Dr. Ta'ana is deleting her record from the the sick bay duty roster. So, you know, she doesn't misunderstand what is happening. She just doesn't realize why it's happening. So it's it's a little bit more forgivable. But that was the one thing I'm like, oh, sitcom tropes. Uh, but that's OK. That's OK. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. But yeah, it didn't bother me, it, you know. But yeah, it does have that feeling to it. As we're talking through it, that's why I was like, hey, wait. Hmm, yeah. But yeah, I like that Tian is like looking around the ship for and sniffing. Like she keeps smelling Tendi around. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. But then I like the fact that, you know, when they eventually do meet up and, you know, Tiana's like, come in here, Tendi, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and she's like, oh, no. OK, what is it? I know I apologize or whatever. Basically, she's like, you know, you pissed me off because you mastered everything that you put your mind to. It's so unsettling. So I'm moving you to senior officer training. What? Really? I mean, it's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's person. And then she goes to hug and, she, and Tiana's like, oh, I'm not sure. Well, OK. And then purring. I love the purring. (laughs) Oh, that was really sweet. And then another bit of great lines, one of my favorite bits. She says, you shouldn't be treating phaser burns. I'm moving you into senior science officer training. Wait, like to work on the bridge? Like Jadzia and Dax? And Ta'ana says, who the bleep is that? I don't know who that is. No, like Spock. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I love that line. (laughs) Oh, it's so great. Like just a little bit of meta commentary, because of course there's so many references to all these corners of Star Trek and it doesn't make sense that like everybody would know everything about Deep Space Nine or Voyager. And I just love that Ton is like, what, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when you're just saying that it just made me think about how the actress who played Jadzia Dax is married to the son of the man who played Spock. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> 
there is a bit of a connection there. So that's cool. Then we have the Rutherford storyline. And then his implant keeps having all these override surge detected errors that keep coming up. And I kept thinking, like, where are we going with this? Because everywhere he's going, these errors are coming up and he's running into walls and just having a difficult time with this. But he doesn't want to f- lose his memories of Tendi. He has backups to the backups, you know, of his memories of Tendi, but he's losing memory, you know, meaning disk space <laughs> basically in his mm-hmm. implant and he doesn't want to purge those files and i have to say this was most this was one of the most intriguing things of this episode because when he does decide to purge the files ooh we start to see some things dan yeah so the dialogue i don't have the exact dialogue but it was basically something like I've programmed in the reason for this implant and it, you know, to make him think that it was necessary. Yeah. They think it, he'll think it's elective. Yeah. So he was without his consent implanted with this device that was not medically necessary. So yes. what's this about? Why, why does Rutherford have this implant if it wasn't necessary and he, it wasn't his idea? That's a scary thought. It is very scary. But man, I'm really intrigued to know what that is all about. I mean, of course, we're going to get some stuff in season three on that. I sure hope we do. (laughs) (laughs) I know. And it's like, who's the one doing like who's behind this and why? I mean, there's so many questions. Yeah. Why this implant uh, was installed in Rutherford without his permission. Yeah, and uh, Trek Culture, their weekly video that they do on Lower Decks, had a very good observation. We don't see the faces clearly of the people doing it because they're right. lit, f- lit from behind. But it's a Vulcan implant, but the two people implanting it have very clearly rounded ears. So they're not Vulcans. Wow. Oh, gosh. Okay. Maybe it's Future Guy. No, uh, <laughs> two future guys from Enterprise. No, okay, I don't know. That's that's very interesting. I mean, we can speculate, but I, I have no idea. I have no clue. The, the story that comes out of this, though, before we see that, though, is just so touching with Rutherford not wanting to delete those memories. There's the scene, and it, it's beautiful in so many ways. When they're on the outer hull, which I'm sure we'll talk about, they're removing the hull panels, and Rutherford is talking to Billups and the camera, the camera, you know what I mean? The, the, the scene is focused on Tendi as she's walking to the edge of the, the saucer section to watch the hull panels around the nacelles being released. And Billups and Rutherford are talking about her in the background. And Rutherford's just looking at her with this like admiration and says, you know, what if I what if I lose my memories again? I I don't want to lose those memories of her. And Billups says, you know, if you're not able to make new memories with her, it's not going to matter. And it was just such a sweet scene, like almost just a single tear moment, you know? Like it was so beautiful. I'm glad you brought that up. I did write that down. I wanted to bring up that scene. That was that was a very nice touching scene. I kept thinking like, okay, what's what's going to be really funny about this one? But it, it wasn't. It was a really nice scene. Um, I, I think the characters had a lot of good learning moments in this episode. I mean, they get it in others. But we really kind of dig a little deeper, I think, than usual. You know, mm-hmm. not Maybe not so much on Boimler, though. But I feel like the other three Lower Deckers kind of had more of their moments. Boimler's just running around going, notice me, Captain, notice me. <laughs> Except <laughs> yeah. for what he does, what he contributes to Mariner. Absolutely. And, you know, the the rescuing of the, the ship at the end of the episode as well. That's true. But with Boimler, I feel like this has been his badass Boimler season, right? Yes. Like this whole season has been really great moments, a really great arc for Boimler. So... Yeah, I feel like the emotional stuff, the the real delving into the character psychology stuff, I'm actually happy with that decision that he takes a little bit of a backseat this episode and we get more of a focus on the rest because I feel like they they were kind of needing it at this point a little bit. And 
yeah, it, it it's all really well balanced if you take the rest of the season into account, I think, because there's so much for all four of these characters, the growth they've experienced. And uh, I just, I, I feel about this show watching this episode, especially that I wasn't watching a cartoon. I was watching Star Trek. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't no, know I how agree. else to put that. No, I totally agree because I remember thinking as people know, who've listened to past episodes, a lot of times I'll judge an episode by how many laughs this did not have me laughing that many times out loud. There were some good laughs here and there. It wasn't the funniest episode to me, but it, to your point, it was very much a really good Star Trek episode. You know, I don't even care if there was a laugh in there or not. I was enjoying the story. I was enjoying what was happening and all the ships flying around and, you know, what we talked about earlier and how awesome that looked and the character growth and what they're going through. I was, in, I was really invested in the story. And of mm. course it does have some laughs. So that, that adds to it, but it is nice to see that a show doesn't have to rely on laughs to prove itself, right? It can be a comedy, but can also have elements of character where what's important to the characters and how do the characters relate to each other and how do they grow and how do they learn and how do they experience things that way we get more invested. If it's just this, you know, one dimensional, just laugh, 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 laugh. It can get boring after a while. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. And that's been my, like I've, I've tried to judge these episodes, not just on how many laughs, but you know, the story they're telling. I've talked a lot this season about the heart of the characters and that sort of thing. And this episode has that in spades, I think. And yeah, I don't know what more to say about that aspect of it other than I was just, I was blown away by after two seasons, how much we care about these characters and, and how much I empathize and, and sympathize and, and just really relate to a lot of what they're going through. And then how much we see of Jennifer and Mariner kind of repairing yeah. their whole thing. Because, you know, Jennifer admits to Mariner that I just thought you didn't like me. And Mariner's like, yeah, because this is at the end of the episode. Mariner's like, yeah, because I've learned that I put up this wall. And she's opening up to Jennifer and go, it's because of me. I put up this wall. I have this defensive thing. So yeah, you would feel that way, Jennifer, that I don't like you, but it's nothing personal. It's me. It's not you. It's me, <laughs> you know? So I'm curious to see where that relationship goes. Yeah, that was a really nice little surprise there. This kind of warmth between them as they realize why there's been this friction and that sort of thing. And you know, I would even say there was a little bit of a flirtiness to kind of how they were talking a little bit towards the end. So that was really nice to see. I love that even like a background character like Jennifer can kind of get a bit of an arc. And I wonder if we'll see her more as part of the group next season. I, I don't know. I I keep wanting to add people to this group, but I, <laughs> yes. but of course I don't want to take away from the original four. I love those, those guys so much, but you know, we talked about to last week and now we're talking about Jennifer this week. It's like, let's just keep adding people. It's one big happy family. But I really liked that dynamic at the end. That was great. Yeah. I think we'll see Jennifer, but maybe not, you know, as a main cast member, but I think we'll definitely see her because why else, establish this right so there's mm -hmm. there's more jennifer to come i'm sure yeah. yeah and she got friendly with boimler too a few episodes ago when he yeah. kind of joined their group for a little while so yeah she's making inroads in our group there's going to be some great relationships formed i think when boimler's like oh captain captain it was me i drew the banners or whatever and she's like i like that guy i was <laughs> like yeah and you've hung out with him before <laughs> So yeah, you you know who Boimler is. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. I love. I thought that was sweet. So yeah, now we've got the rescue mission, and like you were saying earlier, they have to release all the hull plates from the ship because of this debris, the isotopes. If they hit this the shields, it will cause this reaction. But if they take the hull plates off, then they won't have that action. So you ha you so okay. The whales wanted a naked Rutherford, but instead we got a naked ship. You know? <laughs> so there's inner halls, but they're just releasing the outer halls. Mm -hmm. 
This was beautiful. Again, I talked about how amazing the animation is. The 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 ship losing all its hull panels and and having to go through this debris field naked, like you say, just gorgeous. What an amazing visual treat this was. And this is amazing. There, okay, first of all, there's so many little things that just foreshadow things throughout the season. And I mean, last season, the the season finale paid off a ton of stuff throughout the season. This season's no different. I don't pretend to catch all of the little things, but one of them that I did kind of wonder about and then saw confirmed online was a few episodes ago, we saw Rutherford and Tendi working on a scale model of the Cerritos. And at one point, most of the hull paneling is off. That was absolutely foreshadowing for this moment in the season finale. Somebody asked Mike McMahon about it on Twitter and he said, I was wondering if anyone was going to catch that. Wow. (laughs) Good call. I love stuff like that. I love it. (laughs) Oh man. That makes me wonder what else is out there that we haven't noticed like that. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I I mean, I like the rescue scene and I love how the Archimedes is about to crash into the planet and they think, okay, this is it. We're doomed. And then everything just stops and there's this warm glow and it's the Cerritos there to the rescue. And it was just nice because it's the Cerritos, right? They're always treated as the lower deckers of Starfleet, (laughs) you know, and they're standing out and Captain Freeman's going to get promoted like they're being acknowledged and even freeman's talking about i don't want to leave i'm thinking i'm going to stay because this is the best crew it gives you the those vibes of all the other star trek series of this is one of the best crews even though they're the second contact ship but you know they're earning their stripes that they could be a first contact ship yeah they stepped up in this episode and are worthy of respect as one of the great Starfleet crews for sure for the the rescue they pulled off. Plus, and I thought of this afterwards, the Cerritos finally gets their it's the Enterprise moment because yes. Star Trek First Contact is is an example of this. Adam Scott's character when he's the the helm officer of the Defiant and he says to Worf, "Sir, there's another starship coming in." It's the Enterprise. And I've always like wondered what that scene would be like if it was just some minor ship coming in. It's like, sir, (laughs) there's another starship coming in. It's, oh, it's, it's the constellation. Okay. Okay. You know, but (laughs) in this case, the Cerritos gets that moment, you know, when they rescue the Archimedes and they say, it's the Cerritos. And everybody just like cheers. I was like, yes, thank you. (laughs) Yes, the Cerritos, you know, we haven't really seen, have we seen other uh, California class starships in the series? I don't recall. Oh yeah, quite a few, yeah. Um, Was it any this season? I don't remember any this season. There's one in this episode in this season that shows up at the end with like the rescue fleet. Uh, Oh yeah. I can't think of any others this season. There were lots in season one for sure. Yeah. It's just, you know, this is the standout ship. Uh, Like, this should be the flagship of the California class ships. (laughs) But yeah, I enjoyed that. And okay, I'm looking through my notes to see what else we haven't talked about. Because, you know, we'll always miss something. And then later on in the day, I'll go, oh, man, I wanted to mention blah, 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 blah. And I forgot. Oh, wow. Oh, the captain's yacht. I love that because when Mariner and Freeman show up in the captain's yacht, I love how Tendi and Rutherford are there. I guess they're eating ice cream or something. Yeah, <laughs> and they're just, just like, hanging out. Oops. And they run to him, <laughs> like, hide out. I was just like, that cracked me up. <laughs> that was cute. I liked that for sure. My favorite moment, if we're just listing favorite moments to the, when uh, Boimler gets rescued from being underwater, his suit's compromised and they bring him up. And uh, the the two beluga whales is like, his blowhole's broken. It's not working. Keep him wet. Keep him wet. Don't let him get dry. <laughs> oh. And he's seen koalas. Uh, you better just stay right here, Boimler. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That was a nice little uh, callback to the smiling koala. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was cute. I like that. 
Hey, I want to ask you something because we were talking about Rutherford earlier, and I think I saw you post this like in uh, Facebook in our in our discussion group. Yes, we have a discussion group, Positively Trek discussion group on Facebook. Join us. Anyway, you took like a an image from uh, when Rutherford was purging his files, right? Or was that it? Or like there was like flashbacks. Was that you that posted that? Oh, that wasn't me. I didn't okay. post that, but. Yeah, somebody posted what what was the image? I can't remember. I it was like uh, oh it was like an art thing where somebody w- w- ransom was like oh, yeah. the model and right. I haven't gone back and freeze framed those at all. I, so I didn't catch any of that. Yeah, I've I've I haven't done it myself, but I've seen a few people sharing images. There's that. There's uh a picture of Rutherford and Tendy celebrating New Year's and they're wearing those silly glasses that have the year, but it's 2381. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't remember exactly how the eye holes went, but it was pretty funny. But yeah, there's there's a bunch of images like that and there's there's some callbacks to other episodes and stuff, but I can't remember all of them. I have to say, I hate those glasses. <laughs> They're so ridiculous. <laughs> well, it's like, I remember when those first started, it was two th- the year 2000, right? Mm-hmm. And it made sense. The two, you know, the two middle zeros, they, those are your eyes. And then they did 2001 and they kept doing it. It's like, okay, but when they get to 2010, they'll stop. And then they've continued. I'm like, no, that doesn't work. It doesn't work right. It was the two middle zeros could be the eye holes. You don't have that anymore. Stop doing it. It doesn't look right. <laughs> it cracks me up that that continues at least until 2381, apparently. Well, good for them. <laughs> well, whatever. That post, I don't know who posted it. And I just looked in our group. I don't see it there. So wherever I saw it, you know, kudos. I need to go back and just freeze frame those those scenes. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is Ransom and the rest of the the senior staff. I enjoyed them as a as a group unit, you know, all being upset that the captain isn't telling them that she's leaving. And, of course, Ransom thinks like, well, you know, but I will be her replacement. Oh, no, they're bringing somebody else in to be the captain. What? And then, like, how Ransom's like, you know, well, why wouldn't I be the captain? I've agreed with you at all times. Oh, no, she's, <laughs> she's he's like, why aren't you taking me with you? I've agreed with you at all times. Like, that's what a first officer is supposed to do, right? <laughs> I thought that was great. That was so indicative of his personality. <laughs> yeah. So then we get to the end of the episode and Freeman is called to whatever room, conference or whatever, and there is Commander Mandel. And she's expecting Mandel to say, congratulations, Captain, you are now the new captain of the blah, blah, blah. Before he gets that out, she says, you know, hey, I know I'm here for my promotion, but I'm not interested in saying the Cerritos. And he's like, well, no, you're not, because you're under arrest. So what did you think at that point, Dan? That was crazy. I mean, again, it's the sitcom trope a little bit. You kind of know it's coming because she <laughs> right. keeps interrupting him saying like, ah, before you say anything, I'm not going to, you know, you know, you don't have to say anything. I'm not leaving the Cerritos. And then the other shoe drops, of course. And he says, well, you don't have a choice. You are leaving the Cerritos. You're under arrest. And apparently a Vitruvian bomb was detonated on the Packled planet and it's uh captain freeman is implicated in this because of the events of previous episodes and stuff to which i wanted to say that wasn't captain freeman clearly that was captain janeway i don't know if you don't if you remember that but it's captain janeway not (laughs) not captain freeman that's right captain janeway made our capital city go boom (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, something and and the the charges she's been conspiring with Klingon extremists. Yes. So we know the Klingon did provide the bomb to the Packleds for them to use, and I'm assuming something went wrong and they messed up and blew up their own planet. Uh wow. Yeah. So does that mean the Packled homeworld is gone? Apparently, it looks like it. That's I, I don't crazy. Know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's how this ends. And it says to be continued. Of course, she's escorted off the ship and flies off and the crew runs to the windows and just watch her go by. It was sad. Very mm-hmm. sad. But so, yeah, that's a. I think that's the first to be continued we've received in a Lower Decks episode, right? 
It's the first we've received in a Lower Decks episode, and I'm wondering if you happen to know when was the last time in Star Trek we saw To Be Continued oh on screen. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm going to say it was in Enterprise? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Shockwave? No, or, actually, the uh, the the third last episode of season four, Demons. Okay. Okay. Um. So that was two thousand five. Was the last time we saw to be continued in the Star Trek episode. I was thinking episode. season four. There was probably one, and then I thought, well, maybe there's not. Maybe they they didn't use it in season. Maybe it was just like earlier, and they stopped using it because there were several arcs where they could mm-hmm. use it to be continued. So okay, so yeah, two thousand five. Then wow. Yeah, it's been a while. It's pretty cool. Plus, the the first time in even longer that we've seen it in that font because that's yes. very reminiscent of TNG. <laughs> the the series finale of Enterprise. These are the voyages. It would have been excellent if it would have ended with "to be continued," and people were <laughs> like, "Wait, what? I thought the series was canceled. I thought this was the last season." And everybody in this uproar, and then there is no season five, and people are like, but it's said to be continued. They were supposed to do something, and we didn't get it. We didn't get it. It would have been funny if the creators are like, no, to be continued on to TOS and TNG. And to- oh, <laughs> I see. I see what you did there. Okay. That would have just piss more people off. Oh, man, that would have been cruel. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Dan, do you... Is there anything else in here that you want to talk about that we didn't cover or you want to just give your final thoughts? I think we pretty much covered it. I really enjoyed this episode. It's a terrific season finale, a terrific just episode in and of itself. After, you know, sitting with it and that sort of thing, I don't think it's my favorite episode this season. Amazingly enough, I still think that's last episode way douche is still my favorite episode of the season but this one is right up there it's a very excellent episode it was so good to see captain sonia gomez so great to see these new starships this whole situation where the cerritos crew steps up and and does an amazing job here and of course the character moments the progression for tendy for rutherford and his appreciation of tendy and Mariner with her relationship with the captain and other people on the ship as well. I just, yeah, I I have very little fault to find with this episode. I enjoyed every moment of it. Even rolling my eyes at the sitcom tropes kind of made me laugh a bit. So I have to give this one, I think five out of five mag locks at the bottom of cetacean ops that are not made to be manipulated with flippers, which is really annoying. I'm annoyed on behalf of Kimolu and Matt. My goodness. Yes. <laughs> well, that's a great score right there. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything you just said, but five out of five is really good, but yeah, I'm in agreement with you. I really enjoyed the episode. It was, it feels like a season finale, very cinematic very much a Star Trek episode. Again, not as many laughs in this one for me as in some other episodes. And to your point, I wouldn't say it's my favorite episode or one of my favorite, but it's, it's up there. It's, it's high. It's really up there. So I will give this one nine out of 10 times that Mr. Humble confidence was drowning in whale pee. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot about that. (laughs) I like that line too. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) So, Dan, when you're not drowning in whale pee, where can people find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Kurtrats, that's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S, on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, and, of course, in the Positively Trek discussion group on Facebook. And when I'm not watching Lower Decks, you can find me hanging out with Mariner and Jennifer, and I'm also on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, that's Admiral with the underline Rex, and then I'm occasionally on the Star Wars Report podcast and Literary Treks, so check those out. So thanks everyone for joining us, and I also want to thank our patrons on Patreon, we couldn't do this without you, we do have expenses on this podcast just to keep it going so that helps to cover the cost and we really appreciate that and of course we appreciate you the listeners for tuning in because that's what motivates us to keep going so you're listening and we like to participate and we love it when you reach out to us you can email us 
positivelytrek at gmail.com or tweet to us at Positively Track. We're also on Instagram, Positively Track, and check out our Goodreads group because that's where we post what we're going to cover on the book club episodes, which we have Coda Book One coming up in two episodes. So check that out with Dayton Ward. So Dan, did you like Coda? Oh my goodness. Well, you'll have to wait till that episode to hear my thoughts. But uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Ooh, to be continued. So stay positive.